Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Nyland. I am the executive director of Paths to Understanding, and I've been a Lutheran pastor for 29 years. Paths to Understanding bridges bias and builds unity through multi-faith peacemaking. I'm also the founder of Neighbors in Faith, which is now part of Paths to Understanding. I founded Neighbors in Faith about four or five years ago because I recognized the growing anti-Muslim bigotry that was taking place in this country. And so in 2016, before the election, I resigned my call to do this work full time. And I'll be happy to share with you today as part of Holden Interfaith Week, which is a partnership between Holden Village and Paths to Understanding, a, a, a presentation that I do often in congregations about Islamophobia and what we can all do to counteract it in our own communities and in our own families. So thank you for, for joining with me in this conversation. We all know we have incredible unrest in this country and in a growing amount of, of uh, racism and explicit racism in this country. As we saw here in Charlottesville, a bunch of white men and tiki torches shouting that Jews will not replace us, unquote. And the next day seeing um, a white supremacist drive his car very quickly through a crowd of people, killing Heather Heyer and injuring others. So we see this taking place in our country. Now, right now, after the, the death of George Floyd, actually the murder of George Floyd, we also see something else rising, which I think is far more hopeful. But we still have something happening in our nation where people are becoming much more comfortable with explicitly signing on uh, to racist ideologies and, uh, and to racist uh, you know, symbols and practices and institutions and structures in our country. And so before we, we dig into Islamophobia itself, we just need to pause for a minute and notice that that's happening. And also notice that there's a lot of folk that are working uh, in the other direction uh, to counteract those, those bigotries and those biases and working for racial justice and harmony, including those that are working to counteract Islamophobia. And so we should all be grateful uh, for all of that work and hope, to, hope that we can be a small part of it. So I wanna step back for a minute at the larger picture of where America is. And, and obviously some of these slides will have to be updated a little bit now because of where we're at with COVID-19, but I'll, I'll be able to adapt to that. So first of all, um, we need to notice that, that, that it, starting in about 1974, 1975, the productivity of the average American worker um, actually rose quite a bit. And then starting somewhere around that same time frame, we saw hourly compensation begin to flatten off uh, to, where, to where in real terms, the average worker today makes less than they did 40 years ago, especially for those who have a college or high school education. They, they actually have had an 18% decrease in real wages uh, since, the ninth, since 1980. And so what's happened with this wealth, with the gap, between the productivity and the wages that are, that are being spent. Well, what's happened in part is that we've seen uh, a situation where, where inequality has risen tremendously. So that 0.1% uh, now own more wealth than the bottom 90% in this country. And uh, now there's other factors here as well. We've seen incredible asset inflation in terms of the stock market and housing prices, real estate prices in general. We also know from the work of some economists like Thomas Piketty that, that, the, that, that the growth of the economy generally is less than the growth in, in terms of financial investments. And this means that the rich continually get richer because their investments are producing at a higher rate than the growth of the economy in general. And so we're at a point now where, where we can see some of the, 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 the dire consequences of having such gross and, and incredible wealth and income disparity within this country, as well as between the United States and other countries in the world. And, um, and there's many factors that this, that this begins to lead to, but a key part of it is a sense of scarcity. We also can see from the home price to income ratio that, that home prices have risen quite a bit in this country. It's, that's no surprise to anybody. Um, but home prices have risen at a rate where, um, where wages have not kept up. 
And so some people can afford one, two, three, four houses, maybe more, and other people can't afford to even pay the rent. And it must be noted that rent prices have gone way up as well in this country. And, and so um, when people tell stories about what the economic challenges are for, for you know, most Americans, we often talk about it in terms of factories being sent overseas or what's called offshoring. Um, but actually a Ball State University study <clears throat> by the Center for Business and Economic Research found that 85% of the job losses in manufacturing in this country were not in fact due to offshoring, but were actually due to mechanization and automation. I, for instance, grew up in a small town in Eastern Washington state. And it used to be that the average size of farm was maybe a thousand acres, 1200 acres, something like that. And a farm family would, would have the machinery to, to be able to harvest and, and till that ground. Uh, but uh, since I was in high school, actually a lot of those families have sold out. Um, when my dad was a kid, it took uh, about 40 days for about 18 people, 22 mules, and a pretty sizable kitchen staff to harvest 600 acres. Today, classmates of mine, who are really excellent farmers, harvest nearly 10,000 acres in 40 days, and they do it with four people because the machines are so big, so much bigger, faster, and more capable. And so they're able to harvest all those acres in the same amount of time it took 600 acres for my dad. And what that means is that where there used to be five or six families along a small road, there's now one or maybe none because there simply isn't enough work for people to do in that small town. So what other studies have done, including the MIT uh, uh, research um, is, that, is that the main findings are though, that although automation, and that includes mechanization, has not been employment displacing, it has reduced labor share and income. So in other words, more of the income from the manufacturing that happens in this country is going to the people at the very top and to stockholders. And of course, that sounds great if everybody owns stock, but the reality is that 84% of stock are owned by 10% of the people. Again, more wealth and income inequality on the rise. In addition to that, there's so many other factors that are, that are facing our society. Um, nearly 50% of Americans report chronic loneliness, something made even worse by COVID-19 and the kind of social distancing that we must do. And we know from brains research, researchers and even from our own experience that when people experience loneliness, we become more fearful of those who we perceive to be different from us, we become more fearful in general, and we're more prone uh, because what do you do when you're lonely? You turn on the TV or the radio or the internet machine, and pretty soon uh, it's pretty easy to get into a kind of a thought process where some other group is, is to blame for everything. We also know that we have uh, increasing diversity in this country, and people are becoming more aware of this. And in fact, um, it's been shown that a lot of white Christians, um, even those in the Lutheran church, experience some fearfulness about this. And so because we become more aware of this, of the kind of diversity in the country, it's pretty easy then for a politician or for, for leaders uh, or even for us just on our own to assume that the reason that we're having difficulty finding work in some ways in this country is because uh, there are more people of color around because there's greater diversity. And that if we just got rid of some of those people, we would all have jobs back. But that misses a whole lot of points. Uh, to which one of them is, it's mechanization and automation that are taking out most manufacturing jobs and actually a lot of rural jobs. It is not in fact people of color because in fact, people of color are a part of the fabric of this nation as are our Muslim sisters and brothers. We are all in this together and we're all facing a lot of common challenges together. And in fact, part of the conversation with, uh, with, the, with our, the greater awareness amongst many white Christians in this country, white Americans, around the death of George Floyd is some of the institutional and structural things that have benefited white folk, but generally have not benefited people of color anywhere near the same. And there is a couple of parts to this. Number one, when land having been taken away from indigenous peoples was offered to folk to get have 600 acres if they could improve it, that was not offered to people of color, generally. Things like the Federal Housing Administration, 
offering uh, loan guarantees. Well, that was not offered to people of color. Um, and we could go on and on with some of the structural issues around redlining and the way institutions uh, have, have, have subtly and not so subtly impacted uh, people of color. And so we, we have in this country great inequity, but we have also some large structural economic issues that are leading people to feel an incredible amount of scarcity. And then even more so beginning to feel like someone else is to blame. And of course, W.E.B. Du Bois saw this as he talked about in his book, uh, The Black Reconstruction in America. And, and here's this beautiful and powerful quote. In back of the writhing, yelling, cruel-eyed demons who break, destroy, maim, and lynch, and burn at the stake is a not large or small of normal human beings. And these human beings are at heart desperately afraid of something. Of what? Of many things, but usually of losing their jobs being declassed or degraded or actually disgraced, of losing their hopes, their savings, their plans for their children, of the actual pangs of hunger or dirt of crime. We know uh, from history that a lot of the folk um, who were poor uh, white Americans after, after um, Abraham Lincoln declared that all slaves were free, that, um, that the poor white folk and the poor black folk, black folk had a lot in common. And there were actually an incredible amount of work done to pit them against each other, to pit poor people against one another, when in fact they had so many things in common. So one of the, the ways I kind of look at where we're at right now in this country is through a, a kind of um, equation, kind of a terrible equation actually, that scarcity plus bias or racism times dehumanization equals violence. The people are feeling a great deal of scarcity right now emotionally, economically, uh, relationally, um, and we feel like there's not enough to go around. And yet at the same time, we can see some people that have so much, right? And we, we have baked into that a lot of bias that when we've benefited from the oppression of other people, we tend to want to hate them, begin dehumanize them, because in some way they must be responsible for their, their condition, because it, it couldn't be that we've benefited from something wrong. And we know from studies that we all have internal biases that have been baked into us in this culture. We've breathed it in through the air. And so when you take scarcity and you add it to bias or racism, and then you add intentional campaigns or messages of dehumanization, that you then increase the likelihood of violence as we're in fact seeing across this country right now. So there's an incredible amount of bullying that happens toward Muslims in, in public schools. About 42% of Muslim families report uh, some kind of bullying incident um, in, in, in a school in, in a year. Um, some only a few times a year, but, but some almost every day. Um, we, see, we have seen a, a rise over the last five or six years in terms of anti-Muslim bias incidents, with them increasing tremendously over that time. <clears throat> and in fact, we've seen the same kind of rise in bias incidents against our Jewish neighbors, against our African-American neighbors, against our Latinx neighbors, LGBTQ, and others. And so we have to understand that, that the kind of scarcity and the bias that people are having it doesn't take much dehumanization then, because folk are feeling like, like they're competing with others instead of cooperating, but then we start to see uh, violence toward them. In Washington State, for instance, it's often assumed that Washington State is this, is this place where everybody gets along, but we actually saw in, in, uh, in 2018, in 2017, excuse me, hate crimes increased in Washington State by 32% in 2017, outstripping a 17% national increase of hate-motivated crimes documented by the FBI. So we've got a huge challenge on our hands. And the question is, of course, are we going to step up to that challenge? So just to define some terms here for a minute, Islamophobia is anti-Muslim prejudice and discrimination against both Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim. I'll explain that in a minute. Resulting from fear, ignorance, political and economic interests, and intentional campaigns to spread disinformation about Muslims and Islam. 
Islamophobia is not questioning Islamic beliefs or practices or the actions of Muslim countries or, or, um, or to, um, to, to, to have questions about cultural practices and things like that. Although sometimes Islamophobia is expressed that way. Um, so for instance, the, the person on the screen right now is wearing a hijab. Um, she is, is wearing a, 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 a covering, which is um, a, a part of the, of the, of the self-understanding of many Muslims. Um, not every Muslim woman wears a hijab. About 50% of people in this country wear a hijab. And um, it is explicit in Islam that they're able to do so as a choice, not as a requirement. And about that hijab, well, look at this picture here. Who is this? Well, this is obviously Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what is she wearing? Well, she's wearing a hijab, right? She's engaging in a cultural practice where we're in the Mediterranean world, generally. It was understood that, that hair was a semi-private part of one's body. And, uh, and the hijab itself in Islam is actually more meant uh, to be about modesty for women in general, but it also includes modesty for men. So men have a dress code as well in Islam. It's just a little different. It doesn't always show up uh, as much as a hijab for, for women. And in fact, in Christianity, uh, we have some statements from Paul, who was kind of addressing a certain situation in Corinth, where, where um, some Christians were not wearing uh, head coverings, uh, and um, and that was that was making people assume that Christians were part of some fertility cult. So just some basic facts about Muslims in this world. There's about 1.7 billion Muslims worldwide. There's about 2 billion Christians or so. So these are the two largest uh, kind of religions in the world. There's about 3.3 to 3.8 million American Muslims in this country. Um, the U.S. population generally assumes they make up a much bigger share than, uh, than, uh, than is real. And we'll get to why that is in a minute. But they actually make up about 1% of the population, which um, chillingly is about the same percentage of the population as Jews made up in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and so the way I would, I would compare it is that 1% of the population is enough to be, to be known, but not enough to be understood. I mean, how can any one of us have 99 best friends? <laughs> so the reality is most of us don't know a Muslim. And there's about 80,000 uh, Muslims in Washington State, for instance. So some basic facts. There's about 50 to 100,000 Muslim medical doctors in the U.S. In fact, in a, in a social media campaign that we are running called Facts Over Fear, we ran a meme about this, and it was incredible to watch people's negative and positive responses to that fact. There is something along the order of 10,000 to 15,000 Muslims serving in the U.S. military. 20% of Muslims are African American. And that, of course, makes sense because about one third or so of people enslaved and brought to, to this uh, nation forcibly from Africa were Muslim. And so a lot of African Americans are, are Muslim, in fact. And 24% of the Muslims born outside this country come from Middle Eastern and North African countries. And that's because the most populous uh, Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. So, there are, so only about 24% of, of the Muslims in the world are in fact from, from Arabia, from the Middle East or North Africa. Um, and they share a lot of things in common with other, with other, other people in this country. Um, Muslims attend religious services at about the same rate as Christians. They believe re other religions can lead to salvation at a slightly higher rate than Christians. They watch sports at a slightly higher rate than Christians. This is, of course, Shaquille O'Neal, who is, in fact, a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. Um, they believe killing civilians is never justified at a much higher rate than, than Christians in this country. And yet only between 38 to 45 percent of Americans have ever met an American Muslim, as far as they know. So in 2015, a PPP polling uh, did a, a, a poll with, with folk that were going to vote, likely voters. And they asked this question, should the U.S. bomb Agraba? And 24.5 percent were in favor of bombing Agraba. 
51% were not sure, which means only a quarter said no, um, which is really interesting. Um, it sounds like a vaguely Arabic name, right? And, uh, and we're, we're ready to bomb Agrabah um, and think about what's in a city for a minute. Think about who's in a city. Um, you got you got water treatment systems and and septic systems. You got hospitals. You got you got daycares. You got nursing homes. You you have people living in homes. You got playgrounds. And we're ready to bomb a city. Twenty four point five percent of us, fifty one percent of us, not sure. And of course, the shocker is that Agraba doesn't actually exist except in the Disney Digital Vault. It's the fictional hometown of Aladdin. So we have to ask ourselves why we're so afraid uh, around Muslims, about Islam in general, so much so that we're willing to bomb Agraba when it doesn't in fact exist. So uh, a couple things are important here. First is that media coverage regarding uh, Muslims is very, very negative. So the, 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 the pie chart on, on the left uh, shows that the coverage uh, about religion on CBS, NBC, and Fox News in 2013, about 47% of the coverage was about Christians. 50% was about Islam. Now think about that. Muslims make up 1% of the population, yet 50% of the coverage about religion was about Islam. That's really incredible. Doesn't seem quite fair, representative. And yet that's kind of what we do in our head when we watch the news. We figure we're receiving a fair picture of what is happening in the world. And then, and then we, they, they looked at, a uh, media tenor looked at the kind of coverage, like what was the tenor or the sort of the feeling of the coverage. And what they found was that only 5% of the coverage of, of Islam was positive in nature. The rest was either negative or defamatory or no clear tone. Only 5% was positive. Now, in general, we all know that the news tends to, to, to focus on the negative. But when it's focusing on a, a population of, of 1% in the country, um, and we don't meet Muslims, what are you going to think? In a, in a set of research, P Professor Jack Shaheen uh, looked at the depictions of Muslims in a thousand films in the, in the 20th century. And what he found was that of those thousand films, only 12 depictions were positive. 52 were kind of neutral and 936 were negative. Which means that if you just watch movies and you're catching some news now and then and you don't know a Muslim, your impression is gonna be pretty clear. And if you go on to, to look at, at, uh, at TV dramas in the evening, um, th there have been until fairly recently very few positive examples of Muslims. Many Muslim actors say that they're asked to dress up in ways that nobody in the world dresses up like uh, to, to, to be the, the Muslim bad guy. And so these cultural factors, along with many other things like statements from politicians especially, um, really lead people to have a very negative impression of Islam and Muslims in general, even though we really don't know any of them. But there is something else besides that that's very powerful. And that is something that's been called the Islamophobia industry. Um, these are a collection of about 30 to 35 hate groups that spend on average between 30 and $40 million a year. And we're estimating right now that it's much higher in these last four years to basically spread fear and hatred and misinformation about American Muslims. Now, what does that remind us of? What does that remind you of? Um, some other campaigns, perhaps, in history that we could remember. So I just want to show you now a little video that we've created um, to help explain the Islamophobia industry to you, and then we'll pick it up on the other side. We love America, a nation built on an aspirational idea that all people are created equal and have inalienable rights. We built our constitutional values piece by piece, to strive for a more perfect union of all people, no matter where they come from, what their abilities are, or how they do or do not worship. Sadly, some people want to tear our constitutional values down. 
They spend millions of dollars each year to make us afraid of some of our neighbors, American Muslims. They use the power of fear to divide us. This is the Islamophobia industry. They spread lies about our American Muslim neighbors. They want to limit the religious liberty of American Muslims. They dehumanize American Muslims by presenting them as a threat. They do this with books, TV pundits, websites, social media, and messaging studies. Yes, that's right. They actually study how to make Americans afraid of other U.S. citizens. This has real everyday consequences like increased hate crimes against American Muslims, ineffective and expensive bias-based surveillance programs, fewer resources available to stop those actually doing crimes, and religious discrimination in our laws like anti-Muslim bills in about a dozen states, and even the shameful Muslim travel ban. The Islamophobia industry seeks to tear down what we have built together, weakening the rights that we all benefit from so they can sell more guns, more bombs, more prisons, more of our young people going to war, and always more and more fear of others. This hurts all of us as Americans, but we do not have to live this way. As patriotic Americans, we know we should learn about Islam from Muslims, not those who hate them. We should all be judged by what we do, not by what others do in our name. We should have evidence-based investigations that are more effective at keeping all of us safe, not prejudice-based investigations, which is what Islamophobia is. Let's reject the fear, hate, divisiveness, and un-American values that the Islamophobia industry sells. Standing together for the rights of all people is how we strengthen our own rights and keep our nation strong. American Muslims share the same American values and freedoms we all cherish, knowing that we are all in this together. So let's work together to build our constitutional values, achieve the idea that we are all created equal, and fulfill the pledge of one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can learn more about the Islamophobia Network at www.islamophobia.org and www.islamophobianetwork.com. So thank you for watching that that video. <clears throat> um, that's a that's part of a facts over fear campaign that, uh, that my friend Anila Afsali and I have been engaged in for the last six months or so. We were in production of five animated videos for about a year before that, so it's been quite an effort. But it's really been a great privilege, um, and we've learned about how to do that messaging from uh, from some really great great people out there. The Project Over Zero, and um, and, and other groups that have done really great research um, on how to, to do messaging around difficult topics with groups that are being dehumanized. So, so in the last century, it's been estimated by University of Hawaii historian that 262 million people uh, were, were murdered in genocides in that century. So just, just, bring, just take that in for a minute. Like nearly two thirds or over two thirds of the American population was murdered in genocide in the last century. And how did that happen? I mean, how do you even like gather the strength of people to engage in that much killing? Like that's, that's a lot of work to do, let alone uh, horror and terror. So um, let's talk about how that happens. And, and this is called uh, dangerous speech leading to mass violence. The first thing you do is you create an us versus them. Uh, and, and, and so we're in, in competition, there's no cooperation that's possible. And you begin to dehumanize the other group. to say that they're not really human, they're, they're compared to animals, uh, they're, they're, they're seen as being a, a disease vector of some kind. We see some of that happening toward our Asian American friends right now. We see some of that happening toward our Latinx friends as well. Um, and then you begin to apply collective blame to them. So if one of them or uh, a group uh, within that larger group of people does something wrong, does something violent, 
you blame the entire group for that action. Um, and then you begin to, to build up the threat. And, and let's think about the way fear works. Um, you know, fear is very real, even if the threat is not. You know, um, so if I'm afraid of spiders, I mean, the, the likelihood of me being killed by a spider or harmed seriously by a spider are very small, at least in most parts of the United States. Um, but we begin to fear it as if it's true. So the fear is real and it's powerful and it, and it begins to change our behavior and attitude toward all kinds of things. And then as that process continues, leaders begin to say that there's no alternative. We don't have any choice. You might like to be nice to this group, but you really can't help it. There's, there, there's no alternative. We've got to do this. And then here's the trick. People become so fearful, so alienated, so full of collective blame, so sure that there's only competition and not cooperation, that they begin to believe that violence is necessary and even morally good. So you have to understand that the way dehumanization, dangerous speech and mass violence works is that it turns people seeking to be moral individuals and begins to convince them that doing violence to the group is necessary and morally right. So most of the people in Germany, for instance, um, were not walking out, waking up in the morning and making some kind of like weird evil laugh. They thought they were maybe kind of doing the necessary, even if, you know, unfortunate thing. And so, the leader then finally begins to say that a glorious, peaceful future awaits if we act now. And we've heard that plenty of times in history as well. And this is the way dangerous speech about a group begins to lead to mass violence against that group. And let's look at one terrible example. And there are so many in history. This poster was put out by the Nazi party. It said that the Jew is the inciter of war and the prolonger of war. And then look at the imagery. There's somebody pulling back the curtain, showing us the reality the, of, the, that's taking place, showing uh, you know, flames on, in a town uh, with this uh, highly stylized and racist image, um, and all, of, all the fists below rising up to do something, to, to counteract this huge force on the photo or in, in this poster. And so you can see that there's, there's actually an implicit uh, some, something said in this poster and not just something explicit that we need to do something about this. And if we do, then this glorious future awaits because then we won't have any war. The same sort of process is happening with respect to our Muslim neighbors today. Now, I wanna be clear, it is also happening toward our Jewish neighbors, toward our black neighbors, toward our indigenous neighbors, toward our Latinx neighbors, toward our LGBTQ neighbors. It's happening toward lots of folk. And so, but the way I see this is, you can't just be against, I mean, we all hopefully are against dehumanization of any kind, mass violence of any kind, but we also need people to do work specifically in certain areas so we can understand the way the arguments are working there and counteract them very specifically. So I think in, 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 in terms of like doing this kind of work, we need to be very specific and, and work in one area to counteract dehumanization of Muslims is like a beautiful way to counteract dehumanization toward others. And there's ways that we can all work together uh, to, to work together. So we have to understand as Lutherans, though, that, that Luther had some pretty terrible things that he had written about our Jewish neighbors. And, and there's others that can do some good work to kind of contextualize that and talk about why Luther was there. You know, he had lost his daughter, was in grief for her. He wasn't feeling good physically. He began to hear rumors about Jewish uh, rabbis um, trying to convert Christians I mean, there were, there were lots of things that he said that, 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 or that, that were kind of you know, coming together in him. But this, this is a pretty terrible part of our, of our tradition. But of course, part of a tradition is remembering not only the great stories and our ideals, but also following, also remembering like when we fell short, when our leaders fell short, so that we don't make the same mistake again. And so Luther actually proposed seven measures that he called sharp mercies that German princes could take against Jews. Burn their schools and synagogues, transfer Jews to community settlements, confiscate all Jewish literature, uh, prohibit rabbis to teach, deny Jews safe conduct, uh, uh, appropriate their wealth and use it to support converts, and assign Jews to manual labor as a form of penance. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> 
that sounds a lot like concentration camps. And, and it is exactly that. Um, so this is a terrible part of our, of our tradition that we've got to be aware of. But what we have to understand is that there are active forces today, as was said in the video, that are trying to do the same kind of thing, to, to gin up hate of Muslims and of other groups, um, uh, to make us, to make other people fearful of them, to not recognize them as a part of the American fabric, because American Muslims have been part of the country before it was a country, um, and, uh, and, and to basically lead us down a, a not so merry path of dehumanization and mass violence. And so we see across the country, actually, um, some anti-Sharia legislation, um, which has been passed in about 14 states. And, uh, and the purpose behind the legislation is not to actually make any difference. Because what the legislation basically says is that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, which the U.S. Constitution already states. <laughs> and so the purpose of the legislation, called anti-Sharia or anti-foreign law legislation, uh, by the author of it, is if this thing passed in every state without any friction, it would not have served its purpose. The purpose was heuristic, to get people asking this question, what is Sharia? And so the, the reality is that, 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 that these groups are trying to use not only uh, YouTube and Facebook and social media, not only using think tanks, uh, they're actually engaged in lobbying efforts in legislators around the country um, in order to be able to promote anti-Muslim bigotry and fear. But we must be clear. Um, Islamophobia is not, did not start, of course, with President Trump. Islamophobia is not only a, 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 an issue for political conservatives. It runs across the spectrum. There is, of course, liberal Islamophobia as well. It gets expressed a little bit differently sometimes. It's expressed maybe slightly softer in terms of policies, but it's very much there. Now, this is Bill Maher, uh, who's uh, in, in this interview laughing and talking with a white supremacist. And Bill Maher says a whole lot of fun things, funny things, but he also, and even insightful things from time to time. But, but Bill engages in a lot of, of, of dehumanization, dangerous speech toward our American Muslim neighbors. And we know that that dangerous speech is uh, leads to violence. So, but it's really easy for us as Christians, I think, especially Lutheran Christians to think, that the Lutheran tradition like sort of made mistakes years ago. It sort of made mistakes over there in Germany somewhere and made mistakes uh, through what Luther taught, but it doesn't really impact us much. But uh, this is what I show people at this point. Um, this is a, a terrible thing. Um, this was offered in North Bend, Washington at a hardware store as a means of getting people to come into the store. If you come into the store and spend so many dollars, you get this free hunting license. And, uh, and so the question that I often pose at this point is, if the congregation was around in 1942, did the congregation as a whole speak up against the dehumanization of our Japanese American neighbors? Like, did the, did the congregation make a public statement uh, attempt to preserve the property of Japanese Americans who often lost homes and businesses? Um, did they go visit, uh, as, as Jesus encourages in Matthew 25, those who were in prison? And so the reality is, is that it's not just that Lutheran Germans uh, made some mistakes and didn't stand with their Jewish neighbors, it's that we in this country haven't always stood with our neighbors either. We've gone along with the dehumanization of our Japanese American neighbors, of our indigenous neighbors, um, who we did not stand up for when they were being, being put into, into boarding schools and trying to have, have essentially kind of a cultural genocide take place. We haven't often spoken out about our LGBTQIA neighbors or our Latinx neighbors or African American neighbors. So it's not just that dehumanizations happen somewhere else and isn't that terrible, it's always easy to see the dehumanization that's happened in somebody else. It's much more difficult to see it in ourselves.
And so I want to say at this point that if you're kind of re wrestling with maybe a realization that maybe you have, you've gone along with or have been influenced by the dehumanization toward American Muslims or others, I mean, I just want to offer a word of comfort to you, is that um, I'm right there with you. Um, I, I have had to recognize every day in this work that I have a lot of Islamophobia and racism in me. And the way I try to deal with that, of course, is I, I ask my Muslim neighbors that I work with, how did I disadvantage you today when, when we do a presentation together? And sometimes the answer is you didn't at all. And sometimes the answer is, yeah, you did, and here's how. And then I have to go back and do my work about it. And the reason I can do that work is because as a Lutheran, I recognize that I am justified by grace through faith apart from works of law, and therefore I can be wrong. Because I've been so affirmed by God's love, I can go ahead and change and grow. That doesn't mean it's not painful. And it may be painful for you. But I think that that's actually part of the work of being a baptized Christian, being willing to go through a daily process of disorientation and reorientation and working to a new orientation and then starting that process all over again. So if you're having some of those feelings, take a deep breath, it'll be okay because God makes it okay. We know that in terms of the institutions of this country that Muslims receive uh, when they're perceived to be Muslim uh, and they do a crime, they, they get far more uh, of a sentence sought than those who are perceived to be non-Muslim, and they get about five, four times the amount of sentencing that a non-Muslim gets. And this, of course, breaks the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says that, that no person within its jurisdiction um, can, be, can be denied equal protection under the law. And so um, we're actually not living up to our stated values as Christians, as Americans in this country, I should say, um, by allowing this kind of, of institutional uh, bias and bigotry and racism to continue. So, so what do we do and how do we start? Well, um, going back to the very core of the Abrahamic tradition, it's, it's important to begin there. That the Abrahamic tradition really was a way to say that, um, to help us recognize other people as people, as human beings. And so there was a time when people thought that, you know, every tribe had its God. And, uh, and that when we fight, the gods fight. And whoever wins down below, it's because their God won up above. And that, that sacralizes violence. It makes it sacred and holy and baked into the cake of the universe. Uh, but monotheism tried to say something else, that there, that there was one creator of all different tribes and peoples and families and cultures. And that the image of God was therefore in them, and therefore that God intended that, or at least most of it, right? And, and that maybe not every part of culture, right? But, but that God, God like blesses and is, is behind and it revels in the diversity. And, um, and so I think the, the Abrahamic tradition can be expressed like this, to love God more than our tribe and tradition and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And of course, I had to come up with this phraseology because I noticed that when I went out and spoke to congregations and I said, love God, people would sort of like slip into this mode where they thought that they should love their God and not the creator of all and love our tribal God. And so what I think we've done is we've retribalized Christianity. We have turned monotheism into the NFL, the National Faith League. And last week it was Moses versus Muhammad and the coming Sunday, it'll be... Uh, Jesus versus the winner. And we all know who will win because we've been in Sunday school before. So we, I think what we've got to do is, is kind of reclaim the heart of monotheism, of the Abrahamic tradition, to help us recognize that the very heart of the tradition is, as it says in, in, in Genesis chapter 12, to be a blessing to all the families of the world. That is God's mission statement and God's core value in the Abrahamic tradition, and therefore it should be ours. Therefore, we are invited to share that same kind of mission, that same kind of perspective. We don't have to make people like us, well, like us or to be like us, but rather um, we're, we're called to be a blessing to them in a way that helps them become who they're called to be. So, so what do we do here? Um, Martin Luther King Jr. said, that in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends.
And it's very important right now that Lutherans and other mainline Christians, uh, especially not be silent, whether it's toward the racism that we saw in the death of George Floyd, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's anti-LGBTQIA, whether it's anti-Indigenous. Um, so, so to be a friend means to, be, to do more than to feel bad or to write an a, 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 a angry Facebook post or something or yell at the TV. We actually need to show up in, in public. We need, to, we need to, to show up in public and, and be there for our friends because um, as it says in the Eighth Commandment, and here I want to bring up some of the positive stuff about Martin Luther, that the, that the Eighth Commandment teaches us something very powerful about how negative stories can kind of divide us as a community. The Eighth Commandment reads, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And Luther had a very expansive view of what this meant. He said, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray her, slander her, or hurt her reputation, but defend her, speak well of her, and explain everything in the kindest way. So when we go along with or are silent about, or participate in uh, dangerous speech toward a group of people, we are actually breaking the Eighth Commandment. We're breaking it right there. And what that leads to is violence. That's what it leads to. And so, um, as we think back to the Nazi era and the way Lutherans kind of messed up at that point, you know, Sam Wells, in talking about Bonhoeffer, said the failure of the church in the Nazi era was obviously an activist failure, a failure to do. But prior to that, it was more fundamentally a failure to see, to see the Jews as those with whom Christians were called to be. In other words, we failed to stand with our Jewish neighbors because we didn't know them to begin with. And so let's just think about a very simple strategy for what you and your congregation or your community group can do. And it's like not super complicated. Like, you do not have to understand all the Quran. You don't have to know how to debate with your Uncle Ralph, you know, at, over the Thanksgiving table and go into all kinds of Quranic stuff or foreign policy business. Like, you don't have to do that. This is what I suggest. Just a moment. That you engage in some humanizing activities. Sorry, Siri is hearing me from, from behind here. Some humanizing activities to eat and share stories, to do a community service project with people around you and to march in the parade together. That is to be public with each other. Um, just to show up because people who see people from the majority religion in the country standing with and enjoying the company of people who are Jewish or Muslim or LGBTQ or, or indigenous, wh whatever it is, whatever the diversity is in your area, and there is some there, when they see that they begin to see, well, hey, wait a minute, maybe we can all get along. Like maybe, maybe we can be in this together. And so I just want to really encourage you to think about these simple three things that you can do. Get together and share stories and have food and have the kids play, right, when we're able to do this. And, and for now, we can even do it with Zoom. You know, you can have a Zoom meeting with people of different communities, get folk together. Um, uh, we would be happy to help you think about how you can do that. There's plenty of good methodologies for, for how to guide that kind of conversation so that nobody takes over. Think about some kind of community service project. Right now, maybe you can't do a whole lot, but you could all go together to help fund the, the homeless shelter or to fund a food bank. And that you do that together because of your shared values. And then eventually when time is right, you can march in the parade, but maybe right now in COVID-19, it's write a letter to the editor on a regular basis and do that together as, as religious communities, lifting up the values that you share together. So Elie Wiesel said that the opposite of love is not hatred, but indifference. The opposite of love is not hatred, but indifference. This is a lot like that Martin Luther King Jr. quote, right? That, that the most painful thing is people who say they're with you, but they just like don't show up. They just turn the TV channel or they, they go off out to their garden and do nothing. And I'm not against any of those things. I'm saying that we weave a part of our life in, a part of our life is it becomes this standing with people who are currently being dehumanized, who are currently having dangerous speak, speech spoken about them because we know where that leads. And fundamentally, I believe we don't have to live like that. 
that, that we can incorporate standing with marginalized communities into the life of our congregation, into our own personal life, in such a way that it doesn't take over, but actually enriches our life. Because the reality is, is I've actually found a part of my humanity in standing up for the human dignity and humanity of my Muslim neighbors. I've recognized things about my own tradition I would not have recognized before, or maybe not recognized as deeply. I become a better Christian in standing with my Muslim neighbors. And it's been a whole lot of fun because now I have a lot of friends who not only I love, but who I know love me. The reality is in this country, this young woman who stood welcoming people to the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, she deserves to be just as happy and healthy and comfortable in the mosque as she is in Safeway, as she is in school, as she is on the street, as she is on the bus. And we long for a day when all citizens of this country, all the people in the United States, are able to be, to be comfortable with each other and to understand ourselves as part of a larger whole so that we, the people, can, can, can strive for a more perfect union so that we can live up to the aspirational ideals that we've often fallen far, so far short of. And so um, this has been my work in part, my small contribution to work on Islamophobia and, and to help counteract it so that we can be freed from uh, the instances of the Eighth Commandment being broken, uh, of people telling negative stories. So I should pause for a minute and say, well, what do you do as a person? Like, what do you do, you know, when it's Thanksgiving dinner and somebody says something negative about, about your American Muslim neighbors? And what I would say to you is um, be brief and be positive. And don't think you got to get into the mud and, and debate every issue. And remember that you're not talking to the person who raises the question. You're not talking to Uncle Ralph, right? You're talking to everybody around the table. And so what I've often said is, well, I would appreciate it if we didn't speak about other human beings that way. And then I would go on to tell a positive story about my American Muslim neighbor, like my friend Anila, who left a promising law, uh, law uh, career um, to dedicate herself to service and, and standing as a, as a community leader with people of all kinds of marginalized communities, um, who's actually sacrificed a tremendous amount um, to be able to do that work because her faith and her tradition and her community have called her to it. So have, have just a short story like that that you can share. And you'll watch and see how people around the table, maybe not, not Uncle Ralph, but, but other people will begin to, to join with you because, when, because the, the answer to false witness is positive, truthful witness, right? So tell that positive story and let it sit there and, and let, let it sort of marinate within people. And they may begin to see their American Muslim neighbors or their American Jewish neighbors or, or others um, as human beings too. And that is, uh, that's how we unseat fear from the throne of people's hearts is by sharing those positive stories and stating our value, that, uh, that the, the core of the Abrahamic tradition is to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Because the reality is, this is where we're living. There might be plans to go to Mars, but we'll just take our problems with us. We, we gotta deal with each other, each, each other here on this beautiful planet that, uh, that our creator made for all of us to enjoy and made all of us so that we could all enjoy each other and work for the thriving and healing of the world together. Thank you so much for listening and for being part of Holden Interfaith Week with Paths to Understanding. Thank you.